Hey guys, so welcome to our 2024 January series APER Notes Lectures. My name is Angelica and I'm going to be your lecturer today. Um, so yeah, welcome to the lecture. Um, there are quite a few of these ongoing, so make sure to sign up to the others if you're interested. They're all free um, and they kind of cover a lot of content, so yeah, be ready for that. Um, just a bit about ATAR notes. So we were established in 2007 as a kind of means to kind of level out the VC playing field. Um, and we provide lots of free resources for students in order to help them to access or attain the ATAR of their dreams, really. So um, we've got lots of free study notes. These are really good. Um, they're all written by students who've scored really highly in their respective subjects. And so um, they kind of provide advice, which is really quite relevant to someone in VC um, as they kind of tackle things that are relevant for new study design or areas which are often um, quite difficult to students and tips on how to manage this. We've got lectures such as this one, um, so make sure to sign up for any others if you're interested. Um, there are also a few in-person ones too, so if you'd really prefer some of those, um, check them out also. Um, thank you to our sponsors for letting us um, present the lectures in a real lecture theatre. Uh, we've got discussions. So this online Q&A forum thing is what I found most um, useful to me in VC. I know it's kind of like, oh, she's literally using a lecture for her notes, she's just saying that. But I literally uh, like applied to work as a result of how much like these discussion forums helped me when I was in high school. Um, so I'll go into a bit more detail about that later. Um, but the website's also been kind of revamped lately, so it's really great, really easy to access, and just kind of a nice, sleek design too. So I recommend checking it out, even just like scrolling through the forums, just to see what other people are doing or how they're using the forums. And then making an account because you can use like a fake email or a disposable email or um, like an anonymous name. No one needs to know it's you, but I think it's a really good resource. Got lots of engaging, engaging, engaging online videos. Um, so little bite-sized study tips and tricks and things. So if you want to check that out, that'd be really great. Newsletters just to keep you in the loop. We've got this ATAR calculator, which I actually spent way too much time on in high school. I just thought it was so fun to try and see or try and predict my ATAR um, and what study scores and stuff would give me the ATAR that I wanted. Uh, we've got articles, so lots of articles written by um, students who scored like 40 plus generally in their subjects, um, and they kind of give, give advice or give um, uh, like personal stories about how they tackle things during VCE, and heaps more. So please check out our website, it's really great, it's all free, you can be anonymous, no one needs to know it's you, um, and it's super useful. So yeah, if you have some time, check it out, maybe take a stroll through it. Um, I just thought it was super useful in high school, and I think you guys might find it the same. Um, yeah, we've got thousands of study resources, so yeah. Um, cool, so let's just get started. Um, so just a bit about me, my name is Angelica, I graduated in 2019. Yeah, okay, so we're doing VCP today, you guys, so if it's something you're not really interested in and you're not here for that, <laughs> Maybe, like, watch this later. But, yeah, so I'm going to be doing a PE lecture today. I'm also going to be doing a bio one, uh, bio one and two later on in the week. So, actually, it might be on right now. So, if you're interested in that, check that out, too. So, yeah, my name is Angelica. I am a medical student at Monash. I graduated in 2019 with a 97.25 ATA. Um, I achieved a 49 in bio, 43, and 47 for English. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, I'm now doing medicine, but I actually did three years of biomed beforehand. So if that's something you're kind of interested in, send me an email. Um, I know a lot of students, a lot of the other tutors jump directly into med um, at Monash, or perhaps are doing med at Melbourne. So if you're experienced, or if you're wanting to do something like med at Monash, same as me, um, feel free to send me an email or write something in the chat about it. Um, I tutor bio here in English at Chief Mount Nature Notes, and I love my cats and my dog. Um, my, like, if you guys have ever been to my lectures, it kind of, like, grows over the years. I started off my cats, and now I've got a dog, too. Um, but, yeah. So, love them. I love long-distance running, so I'm just training again for the Melbourne Half Marathon this year. And, yeah. Hopefully, let's put it back in. Um, I've been tutoring P for four years. This is my fifth year now, actually. So, I've been starting... I started straight after high school, since I graduated. So, 20... End of 2019, start 2020. Um, all through COVID and my first year post grad, and now it's my second year post grad. So, just in general, what we're going to be doing for this lecture today is we're going to go through each area of study. We'll revise tips and advice for each area of study. I'll try and give you some background, kind of an intro to the topics that we're looking at. It is kind of a lot of information, so I'm going to try and do my best to try and 
like distill it in such a way that it's kind of easy to understand and it shouldn't be like a full learning experience it's kind of just like an intro so that when you get to a particular area of study you're not like wow I've never seen this in my life because I actually um I didn't do 1-2 PE and so a lot of this did kind of come as a shock to me like biomechanics especially I was like I don't know if this was in 1-2 PE or not but it was like it was a lot so I just want to give you guys a bit of um, background really or kind of a foundation that you can build upon um, hopefully you guys can be like can access the live chat right now so if you have any questions just put them into the live chat and I will just do my best to answer them so yeah just put them in whenever you don't have to wait till the end of a, a chapter or a topic just put them in whenever okay this is a bit of a long lecture today um, so please bear with me all the slides are going to be downloadable at the end you can rewatch this lecture too I'm pretty sure at the end as well so if I go through something too fast um, just you know, if you want to clarify something, put it into the chat and I will just message you back and just try and clarify it. And everyone can see that too, so make sure the chat is appropriate. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, it is a lot of content. You can see all these little, like, headings at the bottom, um, kind of like little chapters of topics that we're going to be covering today. So it is a lot, and there are some areas which I might actually just kind of skip over, but I'm putting them in these slides so that you can kind of use these slides as... Um, not like a textbook exactly, but kind of a foundation, but kind of like study notes. So I've just kind of put in a lot of info. I might not go through all of it, but at least you have these notes and you can look back and refer to them because they kind of condense everything really well. And they're actually taken from my slides that I use to tutor students throughout the year. So they should be quite useful. Hopefully they are useful. If I cover something and I've only covered a little bit of it, just be like aware that I am just putting it there so that you guys can use it later. Okay, so Unit 3 and Unit 4 PE is actually really heavy. Like, I was really shocked by how heavy it was. And I actually kind of felt like it was maybe a bit heavier than the bio exam, but which is my personal opinion, just because it covers so many topics. Like, bio feels very much like, yes, this is biology. This is, like, cells and, um, I don't know, immunity and stuff. Whereas PE feels like it takes topics from so many different areas. Like, it does take quite a bit of, like, physiology and physics and... Um, like metabolism and stuff, chemistry. So it feels very varied and it kind of feels like you need quite a lot of um, background from many different areas of study. So I do find it is quite heavy. Um, I can add this on the side. So overall, we'll be looking at movement skills, coaching, practice, and feedback, biomechanics, energy systems, acute responses, activity analysis, fitness components, fitness testing, training methods and principles psychological and nutritional strategies, and chronic adaptations. So, um, I think I'm going to really focus in particular areas which I think might be, like, the highest yield. So, for example, with um, some of the fitness components, I'm not going to be spending a lot of time on them. Um, and, like, I would probably spend a lot more time on them later on in the year when we do, like, the mid-year or the towards the end of the year, like, September series lectures, whereby that might be more useful. Um, so at the moment, it's really going to be covering more of the like, unit 3 stuff, I would say, but also um, more detailed things which I think are high yield, such as biomechanics and energy systems. Whereas things like fitness components, it's not really a huge focus and it won't be for quite a long time, so I won't spend too much time on that. But hopefully that's alright with you guys. Okay, so I have put a few dot points at the top of each lecture, so, um, or each set of slides really. So these are just kind of clarifying what dot points are found in the VCAS study guide. So I'm pretty sure the study guide is going to be the same for this year. I think this is the final year that this current study design is being used. Um, so really make sure you're on top of these things. I always tell my students to print out the study design. Like I printed out just the dot points. You just have a, a whole entire book. That's kind of a lot. But if you print out the dot points and laminate it and maybe like get like a little um, whiteboard marker and tick it off as you work through it. I found that really useful and something about just like ticking off a particular area of study just felt really satisfying to me, it kind of motivated me to study. So we will go into study tips and stuff at the end, but yeah, just I find printing out the study design to be really useful, being able to tick it off, laminate it like that and just have it on your wall or at your desk or something like that, I just think is really useful. Anyway, so for movement skills. Um, so the classification of movement skills including fundamental movement skills, sport specific skills, open and closed skills, gross and fine skills, and discrete, serial, and continuous motor skills. Uh, this area of study, I don't find too difficult. I feel like it's quite, like, approachable for all students. The main thing that kind of trips people up is that 
it's done right at the start of the year, generally. Um, a lot of my students, we all did it at the start of the year. So it's something that's like quite easy to forget, especially with all these words which kind of sound similar, like discrete, serial, continuous, sport specific, open, closed, gross, science. Like they kind of um, like make sure you're really on top of distinguishing what they mean. And this is where I find flashcards really useful. So I used to use handwritten flashcards in high school. I've now switched to using like Anki and making some flashcards on my like iPad on um, good notes and things. So I just find them really useful for kind of making sure that you stay on top of things that you've studied previously. Um, or you can just make flashcards in like Word and then print them out, which I also find quite useful. Or even just looking up like a flashcard generator online. Anyway, okay, let's get into the actual content. So it's really important that you guys do uh, develop an ability to kind of distinguish between all these things and kind of just explain what they are just off the bat without looking at your notes. So that would be what I'm really aspiring for as a student in year 12 or year 11 doing year 12 um, here. So really be able to define what fundamental movement skills are. That's a really common exam question. So that's usually worth one point in the exam. So these are basic skills that allow individuals to develop sports specific skills later on. They include things such as walking, running and throwing. You can actually build upon these skills. So for example, you can build upon throwing and like lead to a more advanced um, skill such as like pitching. So it is like a variant of the throw, but it's kind of more advanced. And so you really need this fundamental skill of throwing in order to actually then move on and like kind of graduate to pitch, right? So it's kind of the importance of fundamental movement skills. So kind of being able to distill that kind of information into like one sentence will be really useful for your exam. Or your sack. Um, so open motor skills, these are skills performed in an unpredictable environment. So things such as like whitewater rafting or surfing, you can't really control the environment. Um, closed motor skills are also performed in predictable environments. Vika also really likes the phrase self-paced. So closed motor skills are performed in predictable and self-paced environments, whereas open ones are in unpredictable and non-self-paced um, environments. Um, yeah, so I just kind of think open, like the open land is kind of more wild than like a closed structure whereby, you know, if you're just performing a free throw in basketball um, or a free kick or something in soccer, it's really self-paced. No one can like snatch the ball from you. You've really got control there. And there's no like uh, unfamiliar weather conditions that are just going to like disrupt the game. Uh, gross motor skills. These involve the use of large muscle groups. Um, which is in running, swimming is also another really good one. Whereas fine motor skills involve the use of smaller muscles or smaller groups, such as like you know, using your fingers to move a chest piece or um, throwing a dart. So hopefully that's kind of clear. Uh, then we've got discrete serial and continuous motor skills. Um, it'd be a really good idea to kind of memorize what these three things are. I wouldn't say memorize it word by word, but just know what they are. Um, because they're often like, when in conjunction with an exam, like distinguish what this is or describe what a discrete motor skill is or compare these things. So knowing them really well is a good idea. So a discrete motor skill has a clear beginning and end for throwing a ball. Once the ball is like out of your hands, it's quite clear that that skill has finished. Serial motor skills are a combination of discrete motor skills performed together. So things such as a gymnastic routine and a dance routine are really good examples. Um, I think it's just asking about other examples like perhaps triple jump could be one, um, but there are many others like which I would probably just stay away from because Vika does make clear that gymnastics and dancing are like very clearly serial motor skill um, acts, I guess. And so, I don't know, I think deviating from this can make it a bit tricky for the examiner and it might be a bit unsure. So I think just staying with safe ones such as gymnastics or dancing is probably the best way to go. Um, continuous motor skills have no clear beginning or end. So running, swimming and cycling are the main ones here. So I wouldn't really try and put anything else down on the exam. Remember that you won't get points for like a better answer. If you just take the most simplistic answer, if it's correct, you will get the same marks as someone who picks a harder answer. So just go for what's easiest and generally what is more commonly seen on the exam as that will be something that VECA examiners are more familiar with. Oh, my laptop is frozen. There we go. <coughs> So our next stop point is really talking about influences on movement, including individual task and environmental constraints on motor skill development. 
to any fact that affects an individual's ability to learn and perform a skill is called a constraint and can be broken into three categories. So we've got individual, task and environmental constraints. Um, individual one I think is the easiest one to kind of think of. I just think it's about the person, like it's about their thinking ability, their body and their training a lot of the time. So things such as body shape and size, fitness level, mental skills, concentration, all of those would come under individual constraints. Um, in terms of task constraints, I always think of this as something that the coach can modify. So if you're like the coach of a, you know, like an under 12 basketball team, you can modify the rules of the sport. You can be like, okay, um, we're going to play a half court game, right? Or we're going to play for seven minutes and then stop and then play again for seven minutes and then stop or switch teams or something like that. So you can really modify these rules. That's that's something that a coach can do. You can modify the resources. You can throw out three basketballs if you want to, just for like a little game. Um, or you can have it played with a netball instead. So you can modify that as a coach. You can also modify team size and number of plays. So if you can kind of see my pen here, all of these things are something that like a coach can change or modify. Um, in terms of environmental constraints, these are things which are kind of like out of your and your coach is like personal control. So you can't really change the physical environment. Like if you were born in a town where there are plenty of parks and ovals, that's really great. But if you were born in a town without them, you can't really change that on an individual level, right? It's something that's like a wider societal thing. You can't control the weather. Um, so things such as like physical environment weather include, like if someone lives in a town that's close by the beach, so I personally do. So a lot of people in my class go surfing, right? But things like skiing would be, less common because we're not so close to like the mountains and things so that's something to consider um societal norms so in victoria for example we really like aussie rules football whereas in new south wales perhaps rugby is a bit more common or um cricket or another sport so really considering these societal things um can kind of like recognizing how they influence um, an individual's movement skills or development of their skills Coaching availability, so it's kind of also revolves around societal norms, so if it is a town in which, you know, AFL is played a lot, you might have more experienced coaches who do um, train students in AFL as opposed to rugby or something else. Support from family and friends is another big one from environmental constraints, um, so you can't really control if your family supports you playing AFL or netball or something, so it's kind of, this is also kind of dependent also on societal norms once again. So if you have any questions, just pop them into the chat um, and I will try and answer them. Okay, so um, the link between middle school development and participation and performance. Um, that little VCAR 2017 is just about like which study design it came from, so it's from like 2017 then, which is still relevant to this one. Okay, so this is kind of, it's got a chart in it or a graph. Anytime I see a chart or a graph, I'm just like, oh, it's going to be a hard topic. It's going to be really difficult. Um, but this is just a very straightforward concept. This will come up in the exam, or it will likely come up. I don't want to say it will, but it's very likely to come up. They like to discuss this. This is more about like, human behavior, I guess. So basically, reduced medical school development will lead to decreased participation and performance for physical activity. What this means is if an individual doesn't actually perform well at motor skills and things, um, over time, as they get older, they will be less likely to participate and perform in physical activity. And this can lead to adverse health outcomes, such as increased risk of obesity or like high cholesterol or reduced fitness. And that can also affect other things like cardiovascular health or spiritual health, etc. So recognizing that being able to participate and develop these skills early on in life is going to set someone up later on in life is a really important concept, making sure that you understand that it can circumvent issues such as cardiovascular problems or other diseases later on is also important to note. So if a child doesn't develop fundamental motor skills such as running, jumping, balancing, catching and throwing, they are less likely to participate in physical activity and they're also less likely to successfully develop sports specific motor skills meaning their performance in sports will be decreased, okay? So you can also consider social 
kind of aspects like sports are often a really good opportunity to make friends um have a team or like a really good support network so not having these basic skills initially will mean that you're less likely to participate in sports later on and you're also missing out on those social aspects as well as like the more physiological aspects too so this graph is pretty much just saying you know as fundamental movement skill development as fundamental movement skills develop um you're more likely to have increased participation performance levels I'm just always really paranoid that it's not working. I'm sorry. It is working. Good. Okay, so in terms of movement skills, um, we've got a big dot point about QMA. So this is qualitative movement analysis principles. Um, these are talking about preparation, observation, evaluation, and error correction. So I just think of QMA and the acronym PO with two E's. Um, so QMA is used to assess human movement. The idea is then to use the assessment to improve human movement in some way, ultimately increasing performance in a particular sport. So qualitative movement analysis may be used by coaches and teachers, among others, to help identify strengths and weaknesses of players and also predict their potential. So we've got four principles. Preparation, which involves the observer or a coach having a strategy for observation. So really that preparing what you're going to observe. So thinking about what you're going to focus your attention on, Thinking about if you're going to be the only one watching it, thinking about if you're going to use technology such as a camera or something to really hone in on the sport and like see what's going on, or if you're just going to do it by yourself. In terms of observation, this stage kind of involves actually observing the team or the sport or the individual. Um, so it can be either live or digital. That's the main thing that BK typically discusses here, um, live or digital. Try and consider like pros and cons of each. So if it is live, it means you're really going to like focus your attention and just concentrate on that particular player or instance or whatever you're looking at. Um, if it is digital, you do have the benefit there of being able to rewatch it later on. Um, a major issue associated with observation is the subjectivity. So if you are the only person watching it, you might think that a particular performance isn't great perhaps or maybe it's really good, but someone else watching it may have a completely different opinion. So being able to digitally record this and then rewatch it later with other people can help to um, increase objectivity, perhaps. Um, yeah. So remember, we've got two more stages of QMA. So we've got evaluation or the diagnosis stage. I personally have never used diagnosis. I don't really know if you even. I'm sure some schools we may use it, um, but I've always just used evaluation. I also think it's easier to remember evaluation. Um, anyway, so what is an evaluation? Well, when a teacher evaluates your performance, it kind of feels like they're low-key judging your performance, right? So that's exactly what evaluation is. They are judging the quality of performance in what was observed. So this involves identifying an issue, perhaps, strengths, weaknesses, determining, determining how this issue could be resolved, how you could improve, and tactics that you could like use later on. Um, during this stage, something really useful is um, the use of checklists and rating scales. So these increase objectivity. So we've got a few like sciencey words here. If you're doing chemistry or biology or even physics, perhaps you may have come across these a few times. But you've got the words validity, reliability, and then inter and intra rate of reliability. If you look at your study design for PE, these words actually do come up quite early on, like before the dot points. There's like a bit of background and definitions and things so it is really important that you do know what these mean because they do come up at like just random times the main one we will talk about in PA is reliability but validity is also really important so what is validity it's really asking whether a test method actually measures what it claims to measure okay so for example you guys might have done the beep test before I've actually had to try to phase it out but when I was in high school I did the beep test this is a measure of aerobic power, right? But if I was saying I wanted to measure anaerobic capacity, I wouldn't use the beep test, okay? So if we like set the scenario again, if I say, okay, I'm measuring anaerobic capacity, I'm measuring your anaerobic capacity, now go run the beep test, this would be invalid, right? Because this test is not actually measuring anaerobic capacity, it's measuring aerobic power. So you can see how that's not a valid test. Whereas if I am saying, okay, measuring error power, go do the beep test, that is valid, okay? Um, in terms of reliability, this is about whether a test method produces consistent results. It doesn't mean that the results are like correct or right or what we're striving for, but it means they produce them consistently. So I like to imagine like, 
I try and catch the tram every morning and the tram is like consistently three minutes early, which is a bit annoying, okay? So it's three minutes early. It should be on time. It shouldn't be early. It should be on time. So it's not like accurate in that it's not on time. But it always is early, okay? It's consistently early, which means that it's reliable in its earliness, okay? So that would mean that it is reliable, but not accurate. Because if it were accurate, it would come at the correct time. In terms of inter-rated reliability and intra-rated reliability, I try and think of like international. So if you're traveling internationally, you're going to different countries, right? I, I don't even know. Interstate is different states, okay? So interstate, different states, international, different nations, right? So I just think if you're going to different places, you've got different components involved. So inter-rated reliability refers to the degree of agreement amongst different observers, just like different countries, different observers. And so what you can do is you can get all these um, observers who take similar training or use the same scoring system, something like that. On the other hand, intra-rated reliability, this refers to the consistency of scores given by the same assessor. assessor. So intra-rated is like, I am ranking the same performance repeatedly. So if I am watching your gymnastics performance today and I give it a 10 out of 10, and then tomorrow I watch it and I give it a 6 out of 10 because I'm really mad at you for some reason, that's quite a lack of intra-rated reliability, okay? Whereas if I consistently gave you the same scores, irrelevant, as to what like my mood was or how I was feeling about you, that would be a high level of intra rate of reliability. In terms of inter rate of reliability, this is about the degree of agreement amongst different observers. So if there's me and you and someone else and we're all watching someone's gymnastics performance and we'll give them an eight out of ten, that's a high level of inter rate of reliability. We've all been trained the same way similarly. Um, and we all kind of agree that this person deserves an 8, so that's a higher level of inter-rater reliability, because it's three different people giving the same grade. In terms of error correction, this stage is also known as um, intervention stage. It's kind of like trying to fix the mistakes. So I mentioned, I'm actually going to pull my pointer out. Um, I mentioned in this part, the evaluation, that you might actually consider what can be changed or identifying the issue and determining what is causing it and how you can, like, resolve that. Um, that's what the error correction stage is. You're actually talking to that person and saying, look, I noticed this was wrong. Let's work on it by doing this. So for example, if someone is playing basketball and they're trying to do a layup and they're just not getting it into the hoop, right? You could try and think about what could be going wrong. So for example, their angle of um, their throw could be wrong. Or maybe they're like throwing it from like their chest area, not like up high. So maybe the height of release is wrong. All these things are something to consider. So just communicating with the actual participant as to what's going wrong and how to resolve that. Um, so for example, you know, adjust your angle by 40 degrees. Something like that could be useful. Um, so for example, during a halftime of a football match when a coach addresses his team, he's trying to fix potential issues that he observed using qualitative movement analysis, QMA. Okay? So that was kind of a bit of info. Um, if you've got any questions, put them in the chat. I really need to drink some water because I'm talking a lot. Um, if there are any questions, I'll answer them in the chat right now, so, yeah. Okay, movement skills, moving on from that, um, QMA and operation information evaluation error correction. Now we're going to be looking at social cultural factors. Um, okay, I mentioned before that I love English. I actually write a lot for work. I am, like, a journalist, so I actually love writing. Something I like about this area of study here is that it is quite a lot of writing. It feels kind of like an essay sometimes, or like an essay paragraph, which I know a lot of people are like, oh, yuck, that sounds gross. But a lot of it is kind of like, it's not like you have to think too many about too many like examples or pull from the literature or anything like that. It's more about justifying your argument. So it's more about arguing your point here. So as long as you can kind of argue a little bit, you can kind of like glean marks like that. So in terms of social culture factors, these influence skill development at all three stages of learning. Things include, you know, time, self-belief, role models, and religion. So all you need to do is consider what may affect an individual's um, development of a particular skill 
and the three stages of learning and then kind of argue why this may have an effect on an individual, if that makes sense. So it's usually like three marks, often you might get it or two marks even, and you might be asked to like justify why a particular social cultural factor can have an effect on a student or performer. So yeah, as long as you can kind of argue your point, it's three marks really. Okay, so we've got stages of learning. So we should know our three stages of learning, hopefully. If not, that's completely fine because I didn't know if they were until I did 34P as well. So we've got the cognitive stage of learning, then we've got the associative stage and the autonomous stage. It's kind of like beginner, intermediate, and expert. So in terms of the cognitive stage of learning, in this stage, learners are often trying to work out what skills they actually need to perform. Their performance should be inconsistent and of a lower level, and they'll generally ask lots of questions. So do try and remember a few traits here. Um, so things like asking lots of questions. They will experience rapid improvements. They will need lots of feedback, lots of positive feedback as well, as well as lots of advice on how to improve. They may even need lots of demonstrations and they may need the coach, for example, if you're doing golf, they may need the coach to kind of like show them where to put their hands on the club, stuff like that. So um, in the cognitive stage of learning, students would really benefit from simple instructions and lots of visual demonstrations. These are really important as well as um, positive, consistent feedback. Okay, here. So the associative or intermediate stage is the next stage, obviously. Um, so the individual becomes more consistent and continues to refine their technique. Okay, so they are improving. As a result, improvements are generally more gradual and lots of practice will be performed. They may still ask quite a few questions, um, but they're starting to kind of get the hang of their own learning and recognize what their errors are and also like evaluate and improve on that. So practice should start to become more varied and unpredictable. Okay, in this stage, meta skills become quite automatic, which results in performance being at a very high level and being very consistent for the autonomous stage. And um, practice should become very unpredictable and varied in order to kind of simulate a real game-like scenario. And okay, I just realized we're like half an hour in, pretty much, and we're still on the first set, so we'll try and move a bit faster. Um, but yeah, it is really important to be able to identify social cultural factors and kind of justify their effect on an individual's training and the development of individual skills. So for example, here we've got family dynamics. So, you know, if your family is really majorly into like cricket, this may like predispose you into like picking up cricket as a sport, right? So in the cognitive stage, you might think, okay, if I'm going to pick up a sport, what sport should I pick up? Let's do cricket because my family loves cricket, okay? So if your family, your parents, siblings love this particular sport, they encourage playing it, it can be like good for you. Like you think, okay, my parents love me playing this, I'll play it. It like it feels like a nice thing to bond over my family. So this is quite relevant in the cognitive stage. In the associative stage, you know, you might need your family to transport you to, to games and things. Like if you're doing a particular sport your parents are really not into, like like my parents, I don't think would have let me do boxing. If they were not keen for that, like it might be harder for me to actually tell them about it, or have like encouragement, or have someone take me to games and things, or matches, I don't really know much about boxing. Um, in the autonomous stage, family dynamics are unlikely to be overly important, but having that kind of feedback and encouragement and just a nice like family support is a really good thing. So just kind of considering the effect of the social culture factors in each stage of learning and evaluating how relevant they are to the, um, to the individual performing. Okay, coaching. Okay, we are moving on to the next um, topic now, which is good. So we've got two main styles of coaching, direct coaching and constraints-based coaching. So direct coaching is like the old school method of coaching where the coach tells you exactly what you're going to be doing and you go and do that, okay? You don't really make decisions about your learning or anything. Your coach pretty much does all of that for you. So the coach, for example, like I used to do like lessons with golf coach and he'd be like, okay, now we're going to just like, practice like 50 chips or go to the driving range to practice this skill over and over again. So it's very repetitive. It's like I don't really have to think much about what I want to do. My coach pretty much tells me what to do and I just do it. Okay? So for example, 50 tennis serves in a row. On the other hand, a constraints-based coaching method is much more adaptive than direct coaching um, and it modifies tasks due to an individual environmental task constraints. So the coach kind of guides training as opposed to runs it. So they kind of recognize what you may need to work on and kind of it nudges you in that direction, but it's up to you to kind of like consider what you think may benefit your learning. So in this way, you can perform tasks based upon your strengths and your weaknesses, and you're much more independent and able to make your own decisions. Um, so often practices are highly variable with lots of different tasks being performed, and constraints are often modified. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, this is another um, particular area of study where students often forget what's going on here. Um, just because it's quite a lot of content at the like, start of the year, it's not particularly difficult to understand in any way, I think, um, but it's just the words are similar and they can be easy to kind of confuse and mix up. So, we can kind of evaluate practice in different ways. So we can evaluate the distribution of practice and the variability of practice as well as the amount. So generally, more practice is better. However, a large amount of practice can result in fatigue. So during the cognitive stage of learning, improvements occur quite quickly and in the associative and autonomous stage, improvements get like slower and eventually kind of plateau out as you reach your like, genetic optimum. Um, so distribution of practice. So distributed and mass. I think it's DM, like when people send someone a DM. I don't really know. It just It's an acronym that works for me. So distribution of practice can be divided into DM, either distributed or massed. So what is distributed practice? It's distributed, it's like spread out. So these are shorter, more frequent training sessions, which are believed to be better for learning and use at the elite level. Massed practice are longer, less frequent training sessions, okay? And they result in fatigue generally and are generally used at the local amateur level. The reason for this is if I'm studying hockey, right, I am like doing uni, I do quite a lot of work, I do a bit of like extracurricular stuff with like my uni teams and things. Um, so I don't really have a lot of time. So if I want to start hockey practice, it'd be much more convenient for me to have like one, two or three hour session once a week, right? I don't have the time to like be doing hockey every single day. So that would be mass practice, just one big session. And I may be pretty fatigued by the end of it, but it's fine because I've just got my hockey out of the way for the week. If I have more time to dedicate to hockey, so say I was actually like a professional hockey player, I can have shorter, more frequent training sessions. So maybe I have one hour twice a day, three days a week, something like that. Okay, I'm sure someone who does professional hockey does more than that. But you can see that there are shorter sessions, but they are more frequent, um, which is probably better for learning and use it at elite level because there's less chance of fatigue occurring there. Um, but it is a bit inconvenient for people who aren't like dedicating a lot of their lives to this particular sport. Okay, in terms of variability of practice, we've got blocked and random. Like, ooh, it's really cold. Variability. I don't really know if that's useful for you, but I just find memorizing these acronyms and so knowing that distributed is DM, variability is BR, that helps me to remember them for these like distinct categories. Because you might get asked a question where it's like, discuss the two variabilities of practice, and you might, you know, get distributed and mass mixed up with the blocked and random. So it's really important that you do know which ones belong in which categories and what they mean. So once again, flashcards are really useful for this. Um, so yeah, in terms of variability of practice, we've got blocked practice, which involves practicing the same skill repeatedly for a period of time without performing any other skills. These are often suitable for beginners who are still learning the motor skill. <coughs> <coughs> um, random practice is performing different skills together, which is better suited to learners in associative and autonomous stages. So let me explain that in a more like accessible way. So blocked, practicing the same skill over a period of time without performing any other skills. So just like practicing that tennis serve 30 times non-stop. Over and over and over and over and over again. It's repetitive, okay? Blocked practice is very repetitive. On the other hand, random practice is more like mixing it up and trying to replicate a real game scenario. This is better for people in the associative stages and autonomous stages of learning because they have kind of developed the foundation of these skills. And they're kind of building upon that. So they want to like be able to participate or play in a game. Okay? <clears throat> so we'll just skim this area quite quickly. Because we are we're going through this lecture quite quickly. Um, okay, so feedback. This is any sort of information that an individual gathers or receives from their performance. So intrinsic is like when someone else... Sorry, when someone... Like say for instance, you are playing cricket. You use your own senses to judge your performance. So you may feel the ball come off the middle of the bat and see it race away to the boundaries. You've used your eyes and your sense of like proprioception and you've kind of evaluated that the ball has come off your bat and you've hit it really great. Augmented is like, like extrinsic feedback. For some reason we don't use that word here. We use augmented, which is like external feedback. So someone else watching you and they might see your performance and give you some feedback. And so augmented actually splits into knowledge of performance and knowledge of results. So knowledge of results is, did I get a goal or not? Yes or no? 
Whereas knowledge of performance is more about the characteristics, like, okay, your angle was a bit off. That would be the reason why you didn't get a goal. So something I find really useful for this kind of area of study, the coaching area of study, is to try and drawing like a, a tree diagram perhaps, so starting with coaching at the top and then dividing it into different branches. Like you might have a branch about like direct and constraints-based coaching. So two styles of coaching, direct coaching, constraints-based coaching, so kind of differentiating what those are. And then practice, you could have a branch of practice and then differentiating that into distribution and variability and then dividing those into distributed and mass and blocked and random. And then having feedback from the coach, something like that. So having a tree diagram here, I think would be quite useful to help you to kind of recognize which definitions go into which categories. Um, so that might be quite helpful. Okay, so yeah, I think I talked about all this. Just being aware that augmented is like the extrinsic form of feedback and it's got two components or subcomponents. Uh, we've also got frequency of feedback. So beginners will need lots of feedback because they don't know what they're doing. If I just like got up and started playing like jujitsu, <laughs> playing jujitsu, um, practicing jujitsu, I would have no idea what I'm doing. So I need lots of feedback from the coach in order to guide me in the right direction. Because I can't identify any errors. I don't know what I'm doing wrong because I don't know anything about the sport. But as you move through these stages to associative and autonomous, you'll start to like recognize your own errors and um, correct them. So you won't need as much feedback from a coach. Okay, just some tips here. So please put in any like last minute questions about this area of study. Um, but yeah, in terms of movement skills, we really want to be able to identify different types of skills. We want to know a couple of simple examples for each. Know the steps of QMA, so PO, P-O-E-E, -E, like Edgar Allan Poe with an extra E. Um, be able to identify how different factors affect different stages of learning. Uh, practice using scenarios and identify the type of coaching and practice feedback that is happening. And be aware of the advantages and disadvantages of each type of coaching and practice method. Okay, now we're into biomechanics, which I found like really quite difficult, personally. Um, like I've never been particularly good at physics or methods or anything like that. They've always been my worst units. Um, so I found this quite like a difficult area of study, and it feels like quite a lot of memorization. Um, it also feels kind of like like you do a lot of content, but you don't get to like deeper layers, layers or levels of that content. Um, so it's kind of like you're learning a little bit about physics but not enough to fully understand it. That's how I felt anyway. So I'm gonna try and spend quite a bit of time on this area of study. Um, and I have got tons of definitions and stuff here, but I'm really gonna focus more on lever systems, which I think is quite important. And also um, moment of inertia, which I think is quite important as well, and will come up quite a lot. So biomechanics involves studying living things from a mechanical perspective, including physics, using measurements of different forces and improving human movement, okay? Uh, I've got like a disclosure thing here saying that you don't actually need to perform calculations in PE exam because you don't get a calculator. You do have to know actually one formula and perform that calculation, which is uh, like your maximal heart rate, which is going to be 220 particularly your age. Um, yeah. Anyway, so biomechanics. So there are lots of definitions here. It's quite a heavy area of study. So I know lots of students will often be like trying to get ahead during the summer, which I think is quite useful, um, but I would really make sure you enjoy your summer first. But if there's anything I would recommend trying to like get a good solid understanding of, it's biomechanics. So try and do that early so that you can grasp it well by the time it comes around to learning it at school, because it's just a very heavy area of study, I find. Okay, so Firstly, forces. We have to understand what a force is, which is when one object acts on another object. And an easy way to think about it is a push or a pull force. Forces are measured in newtons, also written as m. Forces will generally change the motion of an object, either speeding it up, slowing it down, or changing its direction. I don't know why newtons is not labeled. Uh, mass and weight. So this is also another important point. Mass is measured in kilograms. So this isn't my mass personally, but you might have a body mass of about 65 kilograms, okay? Weight, on the other hand, like when you get on the scale, you often say, I weigh this. That's actually wrong, so I'm not really sure why it's stuck around for so long, but weight is the force acting on the object due to gravity. Maybe because our gravity on Earth is, you know, even then it should be measured in newtons, not kilograms. So weight is the force acting on an object due to gravity. So for example, 
weight is equal to mass times gravity. So it's measured in newtons. So when you get on the scale and you like read your weight, it should be like newtons, like it shouldn't be kilograms. But I've never seen a scale that says you are 70 newtons or whatever, you know? Um, so yeah, weight is equal to mass times the acceleration of gravity. Because we're on Earth, the acceleration of gravity is like 9.8 meters per second squared, right? But if you're on Mars or the moon or literally anywhere else in the universe, the gravity acting on you is going to be different. As a result, your weight will be different. However, your mass will always stay the same. It's quite a contentious point. This isn't really something that comes up in the exam very much at all, but it is good to understand. Okay, this one does though. These three laws of motion are very important and they do come up quite often, so I would highly recommend knowing them. So Newton's first law of motion is also known as the law of inertia. If you're asked to define Newton's first law, you can't just write the law of inertia though. You have to actually explain the whole thing. So know something like along these lines. So an object at rest or in motion will remain at rest or in motion unless acted upon by an external unbalanced force. Um, I know my definition's a bit different to that one there, just a tiny bit, but what have you memorized? Make sure it's something along those lines, okay? And that you write out the whole thing, not just the law of inertia. Newton's second law of motion is pretty much force equals mass times acceleration. So you can write down F equals MA, but what you then need to do is actually write it out in words. So Newton's second law of motion states that the force of an object is equal to its mass times by or multiplied by its acceleration. What this means is that something which has a bigger mass will require more force in order to accelerate it. Okay, because you can actually rearrange this formula. Um, I like don't do any math anymore. Let's see if I can force oh, equals mass times acceleration. Um, okay. You want to get a by itself. You can say a is equal to. I hope it's actually written. Something like that. Anyway, um, hopefully that's right. Anyway, what you do is you do re rearrange that formula and you get um acceleration by itself, okay? Um, and as a result of this, you can restate that formula. So the more force an object has, the more, sorry, the more mass an object has, the more force is required to accelerate, something like that. Um, but yeah, really just knowing F equals MA is your starting point for this second law of motion. Newton's third law of um, motion is like the law of action reaction, but you do have to say the whole thing again. So for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So, for example here, when you hit a tennis ball with a racket, your racket hits the ball. You can see that ball go flying. And the ball will also actually have an equal reaction on the racket. But because the ball is so much smaller than the racket, it's got much less force, it's it's kind of hard to see, okay? So, it's just about understanding that. So, for example, when you jump on Earth, you exert a force on the Earth, and the Earth also exerts a force on you. So it's it's something that's kind of complex to see. A good example there is when you are on a boat. Like if you've ever been rowing and you've jumped off the boat, and you can see the boat go backwards and you go forwards. So that's the law of action reaction. So for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You can kind of go opposite ways. Okay, this is a very dense slide. Um, I know it looks a bit insane. Like very heavy but it's going to be very useful so I have written quite a lot here because it will be quite helpful for you later on so if you want to just save the slide you can download these slides later um but yeah it, it's quite a lot so I'll try and do my best to kind of make it as easy to understand as possible um and just kind of take out the most important bits and kind of convey them to you so what is inertia it's the tendency for an object to resist a change to its state of motion so if an object is traveling, like a truck is traveling at 100 um, kilometers an hour on the freeway, it wants to keep moving in that direction, okay? Especially if it's got quite high mass. So something which try and like crashes into the truck, it won't have like huge, it might have a huge effect, but it, it shouldn't have as much an effect as another truck, which is more, like if a higher mass, it has a higher inertia. So this truck wants to continue in that kind of direction at that kind of speed. Momentum is the amount of motion that a moving object has. It's just a bit hard to understand. Like You don't need to know too much about it, but having this kind of basic understanding is really good. What you do want to know, though, is momentum is equal to mass times velocity. So 
So P is equal to mv. This is a really important formula to know. P equals mv. So you do want to know that for later. Momentum is measured in kilograms in per meter squared. Okay? So imagine that two objects with the same velocity. The one with the greater mass will have the most momentum. And it's the same as the object with two mass. The one with the greatest velocity will have the most momentum because of this formula. Okay, conservation momentum. So in an isolated collision, momentum will always be conserved, which means the total net momentum before the collision is equal to the total net momentum after the collision. Okay, I think I have some pictures of Skype. Yeah, I do. Okay, this is a really good diagram picture describing it. So just kind of um, explaining the conservation of momentum here. So we can see the guy on the left has a momentum of 100 kilograms a meter second, whereas the guy on the right has 80. Who has the most momentum here? The guy on the left. However, this entire system has like 180 kilograms per meter second momentum. Um, so we need to conserve that. So the net momentum here will be 100 take away 80, because they're kind of colliding with each other. Um, because this guy is going, like if they're going in different directions, they're going to continue on in the direction that the guy with the most momentum actually has. So this guy has 100 kilograms per meter second of momentum going in the right hand direction, whereas this guy's going the left hand direction. Because he has more momentum than this other guy, we're going to actually subtract the momentum, 100, take 80, and that leaves us with 20, which means we're going to have 20 kilograms per second momentum traveling in the right hand direction. So when they collide, they're actually going to continue moving in this right hand direction, because this guy has more momentum. So remember that um, uh, it's P equals mv, we check that. Yep, momentum is mass times velocity. So if they both weigh the same, whoever has the most velocity will actually have the most momentum. So if you are coming up against someone who's much bigger than you perhaps, if you can kind of increase your velocity and speed up a bit, you could probably try and gain more momentum, which means that when you do collide, you'll continue traveling in your direction as opposed to the direction of your opponent, okay? Um, something else to note is the summation of momentum. So this refers to an object being struck with maximal velocity. So when the object is to hit it as, oh sorry, when the object, like the, the goal, is to hit it as far as possible. So momentum is generated through the body in a sequential fashion, beginning with body parts closest to the center of gravity, such as the chest and torso, transit to the parts of the body or further away. So going to the arms, forearms, wrists, fingertips, etc. Um, impulse is the change in momentum of an object. So in order to change momentum, a force needs to be applied to an object over a period of time. So impulse is equal to force times time. So imagine when you're catching a ball that is coming at you quite quickly. When you catch it, you like move your hands back to try and cushion the ball. Okay, so that moving the, your hands back is actually increasing the time over which you're letting the force of the ball apply to your hands. <coughs> um, because you're spreading that force over a great amount of time, it means that there is less force kind of applied on your hands in an instant, which kind of decreases the risk of injury, okay? So, yeah, increasing the time over which you apply the force can actually decrease the force of the ball or the object on your, your body, and therefore decrease the risk of injury. Another thing you can consider in this example is jumping off a wall. Um, so when you jump off a wall, you might be taught to like end up in like a what do they call it? They call it the motorbike pose or something like that. Like you bend your knees and kind of cushion the blow of the force. So this kind of like cushioning act is also increasing the time over which that force is applied, and as a result, you can actually reduce the risk of injury uh, because you are decreasing that force. So it's actually quite useful in real life. Just good to know. Okay. Um, we've already looked at linear motion, which is those three laws. Now we're looking at angular motion, and they're pretty much very similar but we have swapped out a few words so we do insert the word angular momentum to remain constant was acted upon by an external torque so torque just kind of replaces force and it's kind of like a rotational force newton's second law of uh motion um oh sorry of angular motion is sort of similar so but it's it's more about using this formula um and talking about moment of inertia so torque applied to an object will cause a change in the angular motion of the object that's proportional to the size of the torque and inversely proportional to the moment of inertia the object has. So moment of inertia is the tendency of an object to resist changes to its rotation. So moment of inertia is equal to mass times radius squared. 
Um, we will look at this formula in a bit more detail very shortly because I do think it's quite useful. Hopefully I do a good job here. So an object whose mass is close to the center would be much easier to rotate. Um, this is quite like a, a short sentence. It looks a bit like a throwaway line, but it's quite important because we might spend a few minutes on it. So an object whose mass is close to the center will be much easier to rotate because it has a lower moment of inertia than an object whose mass is spread far away from the center. So pretty much a small stick is easier to rotate than a big stick, okay? So junior players often use smaller equipment because they're easy to rotate because they've got a lower moment of inertia because their mass is closer to the center, therefore they're easy to rotate than a bigger object, which has a mass which is further away from the center and has a higher moment of inertia. Okay, <clears throat> third law of motion. For every torque, there's an equal and opposite torque. Pretty much just replace force with torque, which is like the angle of it, or rotation of it. Okay, this slide is really important, you guys. So I would actually bookmark this slide here. This comes up quite frequently on exams and stacks. I would actually expect it to come up again, um, just because it is a very common question example scenario. So, angular momentum is the amount of angular motion that an object has. It is always conserved. Here is a formula, okay? Angular momentum is equal to moment of inertia times angular velocity. I'm actually going to annotate the slide, and I would recommend you guys, like, take some notes here, because this is something very important. Um, so, moment of inertia. Moment of inertia also has its own formula. So, moment of inertia is equal to mass times, so hard to, like, do it on my laptop, radius squared. Okay, mass times radius squared. So, moment of inertia is equal to mass times radius squared. It's also really important to understand these concepts of conservation because um, I didn't really think I understood this well enough in high school and I feel like I do now. <laughs> so I'm just going to try and make sure that you guys understand this as well. So you know how at the start I said there were going to be some areas which I would skip and some areas which I'd try and spend quite a bit of time on? This is going to be an area that I spend a lot of time on because I think this is quite a high yield area. So I think this is like the time to like pay attention here. Like if you take anything away from this, I think this would be a really good thing to take away from this lecture. Okay, so angular momentum is the amount of angular motion that an object has. Here is our formula for angular momentum. You must memorize this. Angular momentum is equal to moment of inertia times by angular velocity. Moment of inertia is equal to mass times radius squared. Angular momentum is conserved while an object is in flight. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's just work through this formula first. Angular momentum is always conserved, so let's highlight this. It's always conserved. I'm just gonna pen that one. What this means is it's kind of like a seesaw. So angular momentum is a seesaw. If one thing goes up, the other thing must go down in order to balance it out and kind of level it out and get it back to like that happy medium there, okay? Which means that if our moment of inertia increases, our angular velocity must decrease. It's like a set of weights, okay? You add more weights on one side, the other side will go up. That's what this conservation principle kind of means, okay? So, I don't know why we want to improve our moment of inertia, but people generally want to increase the angular velocity because it means they will be faster, okay? So if we want to increase our angular velocity, what we can do is kind of manipulate this formula. So we can actually, in order to increase angular velocity, we can try and decrease moment of inertia, which actually has some real world benefit. So for example, if you are a diver jumping off a diving board at the pool, and you do somersaults, okay? You want to do like five somersaults to jump off that board, okay? You need to be pretty fast for that. You need to have a high angular velocity, okay? In order to have a high angular velocity, you want to have this like a low moment of inertia. <clears throat> so if we address this question here, why does a diver go into the tuck position to perform a triple somersault? So angular momentum is conserved while an object is in flight. We know that angular momentum is conserved, which means that one thing goes up, or one component goes up, the other must go down. This means that when a diver goes into tuck position, the moment of inertia is decreased. 
because their mass is, okay, all of that doesn't really make enough sense for us yet. What's really important is that we actually pull this formula apart and we actually kind of separate it into its like core components. So we've got moment of inertia and angular velocity. Our formula for moment of inertia is equal to mass times radius squared, okay? We can increase our mass, we can increase our radius. If we increase this though, this means that our angular velocity would decrease. So if you are heavier, or you have more mass, or you put on an ankle weight or something, <coughs> your mass would be more. If your mass is more, your angular velocity would be less. If you think of someone like jumping into a pool and doing like a big belly flop as well, actually we'll move on to that concept in a second. Radius. So if I crouch up small, my radius is really small. If I stretch out wide, my radius is wide. So if you imagine someone jumping to the pool and they're belly flopping and they've like spread out their arms, they're just like diving and just flopping into the pool. You can kind of almost see that happening in slow motion. Like it kind of feels like they are moving slower. Whereas someone who does like a graceful little dive, they're very, you know, kept their body very like closed in together and like aerodynamically like thin like that. Like their body is just a very thin needle going into the water. It feels like they're going quite fast. And like the reason it feels like that is because it, it literally is feeling a bit slower or heavier, right? They've got more angular velocity when they crouch up smaller as compared to when they like flop in, okay? Okay, so I feel like I've been talking for like five minutes and it's very confusing, but this is gonna make sense in a second. So, I must be quite dry. The air is so dry today. Okay, let's start again. Or just like recap what we know so far. Angular momentum is conserved, which means its core components, moment of inertia and angular velocity must be kind of balanced as a seesaw. So if moment of inertia goes up, angular velocity goes down. What's quite useful to us is that if we are a diver, we can actually increase our angular velocity. This is useful because it means that we can actually fit in more somersaults when we're diving. So what we want to do is increase our angular velocity. And we know that to increase this, we must decrease our moment of inertia. How can we decrease our moment of inertia? Well, we can actually decrease our moment of inertia by decreasing our mass or decreasing our radius. Just like snapping your fingers and decreasing your mass is quite difficult unless you take off like an ankle weight or something like that. So that's usually quite out of the question for something instantaneous. But what we can do is we can make our radius really small. So if we curl up really small, our mass will remain the same. Our radius will actually decrease. And this means that overall our moment of inertia will decrease. Because this is not conserved. This can just go down depending on its core components. <clears throat> if our moment of inertia is decreased, this means our angular velocity increases. Okay, so we actually have a faster velocity. Which means we can actually like get in more somersaults before we hit the water. So that's quite useful to people who do diving, I guess. So overall, we can actually manipulate our moment of inertia in order to influence our angular momentum and attain a higher or lower velocity, depending on our radius. And our radius is really like, how wide is our body at this present moment? Or how like wide is it now? And comparing that. I know that was a very convoluted explanation. Please let me know in the chat if that did make sense. Um, try and go back and reread this. Maybe take a photo of my screen now. You can go back and rewatch this recording later. But really try and get a grasp on this concept, okay? Because it is quite useful. You can see here that because this person has like quite a long radius, they're actually quite slow. Whereas this person's got a very small radius. Sorry, I don't know why the diameter of the radius would just be one. Whereas this person has a very small radius, they're actually a lot faster. They've got a faster angular velocity. Okay, so we're about more than an hour in now. But hopefully that makes sense. Please let me know if you want a bit more clarification. I can try and write it out in the chat. But yeah, try and go back and rewatch this and try and like understand it and break it up into its core components because this is a very important part of the study design and it's quite a common thing which is asked by the examiners. Okay, we might just gloss through quite a bit of this because you will cover this. It isn't too hard to understand. If you're doing methods or any kind of math, you might actually cover it there too. It's quite simplistic. But ultimately, the formula for speed is distance over time. The formula for velocity is displacement over time. Velocity is a vector, which means it has a direction. So for example, 10 meters per second north. Um, what is displacement? If you have like a 400 meter running track and you start here and you do one lap, your distance is gonna be 400 meters, but your displacement is pretty much drawing a straight line from your start and end point. And if your start and end point are the same, you haven't moved anywhere according to displacement, okay? So your displacement is zero. 
that's all split sweeteners, really. Well, as far as we need to know for PA anyway. Um, acceleration is a change in velocity over a period of time. So change in velocity over change in time. Zero acceleration does not mean no movement. So if we think about this concept, this is also something to note. If our acceleration is zero, it simply means we can either be not moving or we've actually just kept at a constant pace, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so just a bit more on this like angular motion. If I have a tennis ball, which I did have a minute ago, anyway, um, if I have a tennis ball, I'll just use this little ball. Um, so I have a tennis ball. If I hit it through the middle, it's going to like just react quite well. It's going to go quite solid through the air. Um, but if I hit it on the side, it kind of spins off kilter. Like it's kind of got a wild spin to it. And this is about lever arm and torque. So the lever arm is like the distance where the force is applied. So where the force is applied, that distance to the center of gravity. Okay, so from the center of gravity where the force is applied, that's the lever arm. So the greater the lever arm, the more wildly that ball will spin, okay? Which means the greater the torque or the greater the rotation of the ball. Because it has like a bigger rotation or a wilder spin, okay? Heavy, slide. It's very similar to what we discussed before. Um, it's more about distance and displacement. So if you're a gymnast and you're doing two full rotations around a bar, one rotation is 360 degrees, two of them is another 360 degrees, which equals 720 degrees. But your displacement, because you start and end at the same spot, will be zero. Okay. Um, we've got a few more formulas here. So linear velocity is equal to angular velocity times radius of rotation. <coughs> okay, so imagine a golfer hitting a ball. So to increase the linear velocity of the ball, we could increase the radius of rotation. The radius of rotation is like the size of the club, how long that golf club is. So if the golf club is only that much, whereas the golf club is this much, you can kind of guess which one has a larger like, uh, radius of rotation, which will be the bigger one, right? So the higher the radius of rotation, the higher the linear velocity which can be achieved. So a bigger club or a longer club will mean that you could probably attain more linear velocity. But one thing to note is that a bigger club, even though it may give you more linear velocity, which means more distance pretty much, um, it can be a bit heavier, so you might need more force applied in order to actually attain that distance. And this explains why drivers are longer than irons, so for existence, for existence. For example, when you want to hit off the tee in golf, um, you might get a bigger club, like a driver, in order to try and get it as close as you can to the green, right? And once you're there, you can use like a putter or something, maybe, or an iron if you're not very good. Okay, angular acceleration works in a similar way as linear acceleration. We're not going to spend too much time on that. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time on this slide. It's quite a quick um, thing to discuss, I guess. So any object that is thrown or stuck into the air is known as a projectile. It has that vertical component, which is how high it goes, and a horizontal component, which is how far it goes. So vertical, um, theoretically, it would continue going up if we didn't have gravity, but we do have gravity. So gravity will like accelerate it at 9.8 meters per second um, towards the ground. Um, the horizontal component affects how far the ball travels with the feet in the ground. This is usually affected by air resistance. If we didn't have air resistance, typically horizontal velocity would remain continuous. Um, yeah. So factors that affect projectile motion include angle of release, speed of release, and height of release. So angle of release, um, so typically 45 degrees is like our optimal to get like a really far horizontal distance. Speed of release, a greater speed of release means we've got more horizontal and vertical component. And then we've got our height of release. And this is really something which can be adjusted um, depending on where you want the ball to go. So if we are just trying to go like a great horizontal distance, we want our height of release to just be zero really. Um, kind of think about how like when you're standing as well. So if you're like, it wouldn't be zero. It might be like however tall you are, like 1.3 meters maybe if that's where your arms are. So that's where your height of release is. If you want to get it to go the same spot, so I'm on the same height over there, catching at the same height. If you're launching projector from above where it will land, you actually want an angle which is less than 45 degrees. 
Whereas if you're trying to throw up, you need more of an angle. So you actually need to add more degrees, so that 45 degrees, okay? So if you've got to throw high, you've got to throw up. I won't spend too much time on this. I really, just the major thing I wanted to cover was that diving concept. So hopefully that makes sense. And potentially levers, if we can get a slide on levers, which we do, which is good. So I'm going to cover levers and that one slide on diving in quite a bit of depth. Um, <clears throat> that's the main thing I want you guys to take away from biomechanics. I feel like it's the biggest concepts which come up for the more relevant, highest yield type stuff. So, yeah. Okay, what is a lever? It's a rigid bar that rotates around an axis in order to exert a force on another object. All levers consist of an axis, force, and resistance. Your teacher may use different words. Um, I actually can't remember what the other words are because I never use them. I think these ones are quite useful and they work with my mnemonics too. So, yeah. We've got three types of levers. First, second, and third class levers. Okay, good. I have a few slides on this. So... We actually have to memorize the orderings of levers, so I'm going to go through my little example for that. But first, just going to discuss the parts of levers. We've got full from low to effort, but I say axis, resistance, force. So that's the axis, this is the resistance, and there's the force. So the resistance is like a heavy load, or like the force that your arms push down on against. Here are three types of levers. So you do have to memorize these structures of the levers and their orderings of the axis, force, and resistance. And so I have a mnemonic for this. I actually sometimes get students message me like years later and they tell me that mnemonic actually really helped you. So if you think this will help you out, please let me know in the chat. It'd be really good. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a strange mnemonic, but it has helped me and quite a few other people too. So let me know. Okay, so three types of levers, axis, resistance, force, kind of shuffled around for each of these lever types. So with the first class lever, we've got the axis here. We've got the resistance and the force. It can also be kind of the opposite way, so axis with resistance and force on the other side, but either way it's that same ordering. Then we've got second class lever and third class lever, where those are kind of shuffled around. Okay, um, I work as like a visual learner. Like I find it hard to listen to lectures, which are just speaking for a long period of time. I need drawings and diagrams and like imagery to help me remember stuff. <coughs> so this is how I remember levers. So I always think of like an athletics field. I actually think of the Box Hill one. I'm not sure if it's still there, but I used to like do my athletics days and stuff there. So I think of the Box Hill like athletics ground. Um, I think it has a red track. I think that's Box Hill. Anyway, so I think of an athletics field, right? And we've got three people running in a 400 meter race. So they're going around that track. The whole field's empty except for these three people, okay? They're running their race. The person in first place at the moment, they... Um, are far ahead of everyone else. They are far ahead of everybody else, okay? I know that's not great English, but they are far ahead. That's the person in first place. They're just, like, chilling. They are going to win this race, and they know it. They are far ahead. The person in second place is kind of going through it. They're actually sprinting quite a bit, but this is because they've got a dog chasing after them, and that dog is, like, nipping at their ankles going, arf, arf, arf. You know, in, like, cartoons... Um, or comic books and stuff where the dog says arf. So the person in second place is running. They've got a dog yapping at their ankles, trying to bite their ankles, yelling arf. So first place, far ahead. Second place, quite a bit behind them, but being chased by a dog yelling arf. And third place has practically given up. They know they're going to finish after everybody else. They're going to finish after everybody else. Okay. So, first place, far ahead, second place, arf, third place, after. And this is your ordering of the levers. So, first class lever, second class lever, and third class lever. So, first class lever, you've always got the axis in the middle with force and resistance on either side. You can also write it as resistance, axis, and force. It doesn't matter which way. You can, like, flip it around. But as long as your middle is the same, so keep your middle there. Second place, you've got axis and force on either side of resistance. So, once again, you can write it the other way. So, just make sure you keep the middle letter the same. And third place, you've got uh, AFR or RFA. I find this quite useful. Because um, writing it out also is kind of like a, not a cheat, because you're allowed to do this, but it kind of feels like you're cheating, because it's like you've got a full diagram in front of you, which all you've done is just like remember this little scenario. So first place, far ahead. Second place, RF with the dog yapping at the heels. And third place, after everybody else. 
Okay, so levers have a thing. If I go to this, like, you just cover these three slides for me in like a minute. Um. <clears throat> Um, I'm not sure if I want to discuss the rest of the lever stuff, but I will give you a bit more example here. Um, force arm, abra, resistant arm. Okay, so if a lever's force arm is greater than its resistance arm, so, for example, if a force arm... Okay, so first of all, let me talk to you about what a force arm is. This is the distance from the force to the axis. So you can see for this one, the second glass lever, you've got quite a big force arm. It's actually bigger than the resistance arm, because the resistance is shorter there. <clears throat> okay, whereas if the resistance arm is greater, this is... You can see the opposite, the resistance arm is greater for the third class lever. Whereas the first class lever can be quite variable because that force can be very far away from the axis. And then you still have to push it. So we don't we kind of ignore the first class lever a bit in PE. Um, but the force arm and resistance arm length can have wider applications for a sport. So if the force arm is greater than the resistance arm, as is the case in the second class lever, then we can actually lift quite a heavy force with relatively little um like or we can lift a heavy resistance, I guess, or like amount of weight with relatively little force applied. And so <clears throat> a very common example of this is a wheelbarrow. You can lift quite a large like amount of rocks and things with little like, force applied. Or another example is when you can lift your heels up, heel raises, or you stand on tiptoes. If you're just sitting down, well, you should be standing up actually, and you stand on your tiptoes, you're actually lifting like the entire weight of your body on your toes, right? That's it's quite a lot of weight. Like, I don't even know if I can lift my entire body weight. I can't do a pull up or anything. Um, but just by standing on tiptoes, you can do that. <clears throat> so, that's the example of the second class lever in motion, which is why I say imagine that dog yapping at your heels, because then you have an example. So, a dog yapping at your heels, an example of this is a heel raise or a tiptoe stand. You're actually applying the second class lever. Um, <clears throat> a third class lever, while it doesn't actually help us lift any, um, like weight at all really, it does allow us to attain a wide range of motion. Okay, so this wide range of motion allows us to achieve a higher linear velocity um, or like hit something further away. So <clears throat> this is the most common sporting example. Often you'll be asked to identify the type of lever used in a particular scenario and I would like in your shoes just pick third class lever typically if it's trying to hit something. I was trying to imagine the wide range of motion. Um, so for example, if someone's kicking, you can kind of imagine the arch of their foot, like their leg swinging. Or if someone's like hitting something, like a baseball and they're hitting a, a ball, you can imagine that swinging motion. Or if they're, you know, cricket or something like that. If you can kind of imagine that swinging motion and you're trying to hit something or kick something as far as possible, it's going to be a third class lever, okay? So kicking something is a third class lever. Another example is like a bicep curl. You've got that like swinging motion of your arm, which is how I also remember third class lever. Um, or like that bicep curl is an example of a third class lever. So yeah, it's really important that you have those examples. Um, I think an example of first class lever is like nodding your head, um, but we don't really use that very much. Yeah, so nodding your head or like the head, neck area is an example of third class lever, first class lever, but we don't use that very much in PA. Whereas the second class levers are quite important. So heel raises or tiptoes, really good because it's got a mechanical advantage. So the mechanical advantage is this formula. When the force arm is greater than the resistance arm, we have a mechanical advantage, as is seen in the second class lever, because we can actually lift quite a heavy weight relatively easily. Whereas in the case of the third class lever, the resistance arm is longer than the force arm, which means we actually have a mechanical disadvantage according to the fraction, which might sound like a bad thing, but it's actually very useful for achieving a wide range of motion. Um, greater range of motion and speed of the motion. Okay, so they have a mechanical disadvantage um, or no mechanical advantage, but they can help you achieve a wide range of motion. Okay, um, a few more definitions here, just about equilibrium, balance, and stability. They are all written down here, so I probably won't spend much time on them, as I'd like to move on to energy systems, which is quite a big area of study.
once again, center of gravity. Um, these are quite straightforward. I think I do have some pictures. So, not amazing pictures, but just kind of identifying, oh, I just tagged one, um, what each of these things mean. So just trying to get an understanding of these definitions. It's quite good. But, hey, we have like 45 minutes left, so I want to move on. Um, <clears throat> so don't panic. Practice using questions as much as possible. Do the practice VCAR exams. Remember, calculations aren't really necessary, but you do need to like have a good understanding of them. Okay? Um, having a set of memorized kind of answer. So that gymnast sucking in the air, that's a very good one to memorize. Um, I'm trying to think of another example which they often use. It's usually gymnasts like jumping in the air, perhaps, tucking around in the air, or even someone diving off the high, the high board. So yeah, I know I need three types of levers and memorizing these examples. Covered. So those are the two main things which I wanted to cover, and we're done. So hopefully those help you out, guys. Um, yep. Okay, now on to like the biochem stuff. Okay, so now we're going to be looking at ATP energy. So what is ATP? ATP is adenosine triphosphate, which is the only source of energy for muscular contractions in our body. <coughs> the only source. Um, that's okay. According to P, it's the only source. <coughs> What is adenosine? If you guys are doing bio, or even if you're not, you might have heard of um, like nucleotides. So we've got four nucleotides in our body. So guanine, um, why have I forgotten all of them? Threonine, oh my god. Okay, anyway, I haven't done biochem for quite a while. But we've got adenosine. Adenosine is one of our nucleotides, okay? So cytosine, guanine, um, tyrosine maybe? I can't remember. In conclusion, we have different nucleotides in our body. Adenosine is actually a nucleotide, but when we attach it, to a, attach it to a triphosphate molecule, it creates this thing called ATP, which is really, really useful for us and actually quite essential for our health and just the functioning of our bodies. So what is adenosine? It's this adenosine or adenosine triphosphate. It's adenosine attached to three phosphate molecules. And what happens is that when we actually snap this bond, we actually produce energy, okay? Um, so when we snap that bond, we produce energy. So you might have heard in chemistry that energy is stored in bonds and breaking bonds releases that energy, which is literally what we're doing here. <coughs> so what happens is that we actually consume fuels and these fuels allow us to build ATP. So some of these fuels include phosphocreatine. Something I want you guys to know is that this is a chemical fuel. It's not a food fuel. You can't just like typically go out and eat phosphate creatine. I think there are like gels and stuff which you can do it, but according to Vika, you can't just consume phosphate creatine because it's not a food fuel. Anyway, phosphate creatine is a chemical fuel. It's used by the ATPPC system, which is a type of energy system, and there's around 10-15 seconds worth of phosphate creatine stored at the muscles. <coughs> Carbohydrates are a food fuel. They're like our preferred food fuel during exercise. So they are actually, we eat like bread, it's broken down our body and stored as glucose in our blood or transported around the blood as glucose or stored as glycogen in our liver and muscles. Carbs are actually the preferred source of fats because fats require lots of oxygen to break them down. Whereas carbs, you can actually break down anaerobically or without oxygen. Which means that when you just get up and start sprinting right now, for the first few seconds while your body is like, whoa, what are we doing? Like, we're sprinting. I don't have enough energy for this right now. Your body can supply you with energy because carbs can be broken down anaerobically. So in there, that short period of time when you're still gasping for breath and like feeling like, wow, this is really painful, your body is providing you with energy anaerobically with carbohydrates. <clears throat> okay, fats are the body's preferred fuel at rest and they're stored as triglycerides. Um, yeah, so you eat fats, they are stored in your body as triglycerides. And then we've got protein, which is also a food fuel, but it's only really used for energy production in extreme circumstances where both fats and carb stores have been depleted. Okay? Just kind of like a graph showing. So when we're just like at rest, like right now, our body is quite content to use fats. So our body is probably burning quite a lot of fat right now because we're getting sufficient amounts of oxygen in order to actually break down that fat. <coughs> if we... Oh, we're also breaking down carbs too, because they're making broken down anaerobically or aerobically. And we're getting quite a bit of oxygen, so we can break things down aerobically. As we start to exercise, you can see our fat contribution actually kind of decreases a bit. 
Um, and then as we start to maximally exercise, we're not getting enough oxygen in order to break down those fats. So we're actually kind of wholly using carbohydrates as our only resource. This is a very complicated looking diagram, but I'm going to try and go over it and it's going to get quite repetitive. So firstly, we've got three different types of energy systems. One of them is the ATPPC system, which is also known as the ATPCP system. It's anaerobic, meaning it doesn't need oxygen in order to work. It uses phosphocreatine, or PC, or CP, whatever you call it, as fuel. So, phosphocreatine is broken down into its core components of creatine and phosphate, and when you snap the bonds which makes that, you actually produce energy. That energy from phosphocreatine, which is our chemical fuel, is used to build ATP. You can kind of imagine, like, a bunch of Legos. So we've got adenosine, and we've got two phosphates. We actually snap this final phosphate on, so we're making a complete Lego. Yay, we've got adenosine triphosphate. That's all well and good. But what we actually want is to break that bond again, okay? So we've built that bond up. Now we can break it and release that energy. So we snap that bond and release the energy, and that energy allows our muscles to contract and allows us to sprint or throw a shot put or jump and do a star jump or something like that, okay? So that system can provide enough energy for like the first 10, 15 seconds of exercise. So if you get up and start doing star jumps right now, the first 10, 15 seconds of that is going to be the energy is going to be provided by phosphate creatine. <clears throat> Next up, we've got the anaerobic glycolysis system. This uses carbohydrates as its fuel. It's anaerobic, which means it doesn't require oxygen. So we eat some bread. That bread is stored as glycogen in our muscles and liver. Cool. We actually break down that glycogen into glucose. Um, glucose, during an anaerobic situation is broken into pyruvic acid and then lactic acid and you might have heard of lactic acid as being kind of a troublemaker in our muscles anyway breaking down glycogen into glucose means we release energy that energy is used to rebuild that bond between that phosphate and the other two phosphates in the adenosine so we make complete adenosine triphosphate then we actually break down that bond we snap that bond and release that energy again okay so releasing that energy allows us to actually provide the energy for muscular contraction um, it produces energy at a slower rate than the ATP PC system, but it actually produces more ATP. Something else to note is that it does produce lactic acid. Everyone blames lactic acid for like causing muscle soreness and like making you feel bad, but it's not actually lactic acid's fault. What happens there is that when you break down glycogen into glucose anaerobically, you actually produce lactic acid as well as something called hydrogen ions, which are just like straight hydrogen ions. But they actually interfere with the acidity of the muscles and they impede upon muscular contractions and they can create that feeling of like soreness. So <clears throat> lactic acid itself doesn't cause fatigue. It's kind of being scapegoated. It's actually the hydrogen ions accumulating in your muscles, which does. So it's kind of like the fault being there. Um, something else we want to discuss is the lactate inflection point, which is the last point where lactate entry into and remove from the blood are balanced. So there's the lactate inflection point. Once you start going up on this graph, you've passed the lactate inflection point. So after this, you actually have hydrogen ions kind of accumulating quite a bit, and that can cause, like, soreness and fatigue. Okay, now into the aerobic system. So in this case, we've got glycogen being broken down to glucose, and glucose being broken down to pyruvic acid. But instead of moving on to lactic acid and hydrogen ions now, we actually just sweat, really. We produce carbon dioxide and water and heat, okay? So that glycogen broken down, we produce energy. This, these byproducts aren't particularly fatiguing in any way, really. Um, we might discuss some sources of fatigue later, but not a lot. Anyway, that energy from the snapping of that bond from the glycogen to glucose means that we actually rebuild ADP, so DP diphosphate, into ATP triphosphate. Um, and then we can snap that bond again, release that energy, use that energy for our muscular contractions. And the system is quite, like, infinite, theoretically. Um, I wouldn't say infinite, actually. I just say we can use it quite indefinitely. So it uses carbohydrates, which is glycogen, fats, or protein in very extreme cases as fuels. And it produces ATP at a slow rate, but it produces a lot of ATP, okay? So more than the ATP PC system and more than the anaerobic glycosis system. So this is a big table. It looks like a lot of information. I guess it is a lot of information, but we really just covered all of that. So... Yeah, we've got three different energy systems. They're either anaerobic or aerobic. They use these different fuels. They are you know, good at providing energy during whichever intensities, etc. 
So really the main thing to know is aerobic system doesn't really produce many fatigue and byproducts, whereas the anaerobic system does, or both the anaerobic systems do. Um, and knowing which one, if your body prefers to use carbs, because aerobically, or aerobic energy production means you don't produce as many fatigue and byproducts, and it means you can continue on for a long period of time without feeling fatigue. So this is like our preferred system. So at rest, we're going to be using this. Okay, so we've got a few different um, methods of fatigue. I'm just going to gloss over this. You can definitely read it later. Um, I generally think this area study is quite straightforward. So, like, rereading these answers later should, should be, like, sufficient, hopefully, um, as well as going over it in class. <coughs> so I won't spend too much time on this. Um, so just noting that for the um, ATP PC system, that also creatine is only there for about 10-15 seconds. So once that's gone, you've got to move on to the next system. So that's our source of fatigue there. <coughs> um, for the anaerobic systems as well, we also have the buildup of metabolic fatigue and byproducts. So ADP and inorganic phosphate associated with the ATP PC system, that causes fatigue. And also the buildup of those hydrogen ions with the anaerobic glycolysis system as well as the lactic acids, which they kind of hang out with. The lactic acids aren't harmful, remember, it's hydrogen ions, but they cause fatigue, those hydrogen ions. In terms of the aerobic system, our main source of fatigue is the elevated body temperature, because what happens when our body temperature gets higher is that we start to sweat. What this means is that uh, blood is actually redirected from our muscles, so instead of going to our like, muscles that are running, it's going to our skin instead. This means that there's less blood, and therefore less oxygen going to our working muscles, so we've got to work anaerobically while we're sweating, okay, which is why we experience fatigue. So the fatigue isn't really due to the aerobic system itself, it's due to having to use the anaerobic systems because we're sweating and redirecting the blood flow to the skin. I'll try and close down. <clears throat> There's a nice little summary table there, and also articulating that we need different types of recoveries for the different systems. So passive recoveries are really good at replenishing the PC stores, so I think a bit more than three minutes can replenish up to like 99% of um, phosphocreatine. So just sitting down for three minutes after a race can replenish that phosphocreatine to up to like 90%, something like that. And then active recoveries are best for like cycling out those metabolic fatigue and byproducts which have like built up within your muscles. Okay, energy system interplay. Um, so you generally have, uh, we've got like half an hour left. Let me just check how many slides we have because I wanna, this is quite an important area study, so I don't wanna, well, we're like halfway. Um, that's okay, because a lot of this stuff towards the end especially is very straightforward and it's just something you can just read off the slides. So I've kind of kept them as like summary notes for you. And then a lot of this stuff down here is like just stuff I'm not going to like read over as well. Like I'm just, I would just be reading off the slides. That's fine. We're actually going quite good. <clears throat> but energy system interplay is a really big area of study. Um, it's really talking about how all three energy systems contribute to you energy production throughout an event. I'm just going to quickly summarize what happens. So all three energy systems contribute with varying intensities and durations depending on the activity. Um, so at the start of the event, your ATP PC system will be contributing the most because all of a sudden you're just starting this event, you're not getting enough oxygen yet, so you need to work anaerobically. So it always kind of goes ATP PC system first, anaerobic glycolysis system, then the aerobic system once you've got enough oxygen into your body going to the working muscles. So at the start of the race, the ATP PC system would be the greatest contributor. After about 10-15 seconds, that will kind of deplete almost. It will still be contributing very minimally, but just so small that you don't really need too much. But I just want to note that it does contribute throughout the entire event. Once that's sort of like depleted a bit, we want to use the anaerobic glycolysis system, which provides energy up to about a minute, okay? So in that minute when you're just started sprinting, um, your body is using the anaerobic glycolysis system. It's actually producing metabolic fatigue and byproducts such as hydrogen ions which are building up in our muscles. After about a minute, your body has actually taken up, taken in enough oxygen to actually take it off to the working muscles and use that so we can actually have aerobic system being the predominant energy produ pro producer. Um, yeah, and it doesn't really have very many fatigue and byproducts. It's really more about overheating and sweating and that causes conversion or an increased contribution from the anaerobic system. <coughs> Something to note is I just kind of use an example of like running a race, but if you are doing a stop start sport, like volleyball or something, your ATP PC system will be the predominant for the first 15 seconds. Then you might like stop and wait 
you know, if someone else might have the ball. So in that small time that you're stopping, you might be stopped and you know, just waiting there for like a minute. Your body might actually replenish some PC stores. You might actually be able to use those PC stores. Um, but your body will also probably use anaerobic glycolysis as the predominant or the greatest supply of energy. I think Vico actually doesn't like the word predominant or <clears throat> dominant. So you want to use phrases such as the greatest supplier of energy at this time, which is a bit longer. Um, which is a lot of students were using the other words wrong. So predominant is like the overall greatest supplier of energy, whereas dominant is like at this time, this, per this system is dominant. Um, but yeah, it's really important to know that. This is a good example. I would, you see this underlined area? This is something I'd actually memorize because it's pretty much worth one mark on the exam. And then the rest of the marks are kind of gleaned from your discussion and analysis of which energy systems will be predominant at which time, or contributing the most at any time, which ones start to replenish when you get a rest, or a bit of a passive recovery or an active recovery, and which ones are most useful. Okay? <clears throat> um, so during the final sprint of a marathon, you're actually going to increase your contribution from the anaerobic glycolysis system, because this increased intensity means you require much more oxygen. Your body doesn't have that oxygen on hand at the moment, so it's going to be using the anaerobic glycolysis system because it, it's an anaerobic system, not oxygen. Okay? So, know what fuels are used by each system, practice energy interplay questions. Um, if there are any questions in the chat, you guys, I know we went through that a bit quickly, but it's all written down quite well, I think. And I've got quite a lot of summary tables and stuff there, which I'd actually recommend going back and you wouldn't have to memorize the whole thing, but just try and like talk your way through it. And you still have tons of time at the start of the year. Have you? I didn't think the school term started quite yet, has it? Maybe just one. Um, in terms of acute responses, this is kind of still more on energy systems to be honest. Um, this is energy systems. When we start exercising, we enter a period of oxygen deficit, which means we don't have enough oxygen to actually supply the energy we need. Um, so we have to work anaerobically, which is why we need the ATP PC system and the anaerobic glycolysis system. Once we get enough oxygen, we work at a steady state, whereby oxygen supply is equal to oxygen demand, and your heart rate remains constant. When we stop exercising, like if I'm sprinting for 10 k's and I just stop, not sprinting, okay, if I'm running for 10 k's and I stop, all of a sudden I've stopped, my body's like, wow, I'm producing so much oxygen, or taking in so much oxygen, I don't need this much. So you, like, your body's taking in too much oxygen, which isn't particularly a bad thing most of the time, um, but it's just like your body needs to recognize, oh, okay, I don't need this much oxygen anymore. <coughs> um, so you've got this epoch stage or like a recovery stage whereby you can keep walking, your body wants to kind of like take in this oxygen to try and cycle out this metabolic food and byproducts such as hydrogen ions, reduce your body temperature and break down lactic acid. Um, here's a formula for VO2 max, which is the amount of oxygen a person can take in and use per minute. You can actually work above your V2 max. I'm not going to go into much about I'm not going to go into anything about this at all really. Um, it doesn't come up in the exam very much and it does require quite a bit of explanation. So I might move on from that. Okay, acute responses properly. So when we start exercising, our body makes a bunch of changes, which are known as acute responses. I just think of acute meaning small, like acute thing, small thing. So they're small changes, or they only work in a small period of time or a short period of time. So if I get up and start sprinting right now, think of what will happen to my body. I'll start breathing faster. My heart rate will increase. I might feel a bit hot and like sweaty, okay? So these are all like short-term changes to my body. And I've got quite a long list of them. Um, they, are the, they come under respiratory, muscular, and cardiovascular. So increased respiratory rate, I breathe faster. Increased tidal volume is the amount of liters of air I take in per breath. <coughs> Increased ventilation is due to respiratory rate times by tidal volume, and then increased pulmonary diffusion is the amount of oxygen diffusing from my alveoli into my bloodstream. Um, so all of these things kind of increase in the short term when I start running or start exercising. <coughs> Cardiovascular acute responses, we've got increased heart rate, increased stroke volume, which is the amount of blood pump out of the left ventricle per beat, increased cardiac output, which is a combination of heart rate times by stroke volume, which would increase when you start exercising, increased blood pressure to try and get that blood to the working muscles as soon as possible, um, and blood redistribution, which means like 
if you've just eaten right now, like, <clears throat> your body is sending blood to your stomach to try and digest that food. If you get up and start sprinting, your body's going to be like, hang on. You know, we could be being chased by, like, a leopard or something. Let's send that blood to our working muscles so that we can actually run and, like, get away from this problem. Once you finish running, you might actually, like, throw up because your body is all of a sudden like, oh, okay, back to, like, sending that blood to the stomach and your body just kind of freaks out and just try to get rid of the problem, I guess. Um, <clears throat> it's just kind of like a big redistribution of blood very quickly, I guess. So, yeah, your blood does redistribute when you start exercising and it goes to the working muscles. So if you are running, it's typically going to go to your legs, uh, mostly. So that's where the major working muscles are. Um... <clears throat> We've also got increased venous return, which means more blood goes back to the heart. So this is kind of a, like, a scary thing that I didn't consider until, like, PA or maybe even undergrad, but we go about our lives and our heart pumps blood around our body, um, but sometimes blood can just kind of pool in certain areas of our body and not go back to the heart, which means we're working with, like, less blood, sort of. So often it pools in the legs. So we need to actually increase the venous return. So when we exercise, we actually like get that blood, which is just pulling and send it back to the heart. So it's important to use your blood. And there are a few methods to increase it. I'm not going to go into detail about it today, but the this does come up in the exam very often. So to increase venous return, we can do we can use vasoconstriction, the muscle pump, or the respiratory pump. Um, so if we just put our foot flat on the floor right now. And then we lift one leg and stand on tiptoe, even while you're sitting. You can feel the muscles in your calves kind of like clench. So they kind of vasoconstrict and this kind of like forces the blood back up to the heart. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm talking about the muscle pump here. So that's the, mas the muscle pump. Vasoconstriction, sorry, on the other hand, is when your veins just kind of constrict. They just kind of stiffen a bit and this also forces the blood back up to the heart. Um, the muscle pump is that when you stand on tiptoe, your muscles squash and that squishes the veins. And sends blood back. And the respiratory pump, when you breathe in, you actually move your diaphragm and this increases the pressure in like your diaphragm area and it also helps to increase blood flow back to the heart. Anyway, you'll notice that I've got quite a few dot points on these slides. You don't need to know all of these, but be able to explain quite a few of them. Maybe like three or four. <clears throat> I'm not going to spend time on aviatory differences because I don't think it's very high yield for the time being. But it's there in case you want to read over it. Here are a few muscular acute responses, so things like increased temperature, increased motor units, which are like the little Lego blocks of your muscles, and increased production of byproducts, and as well as decreased energy substrate levels, because your body is using those fuels, so obviously you've got less of them. A few tips here, which you guys can read over. Um, okay, activity analysis. I want you guys to memorize these four things, because this is a quite an exam question like what are the four components or what are the components in the activity analysis and you might have four marks there so memorize the frequencies movement patterns heart rates and what's the rest ratio okay uh i think i mentioned at the start that there was quite a bit about fitness components which i wasn't going to go into detail about these are all here for you you guys can like read through this and memorize it later or understand it it's really probably stuff you've done before like the beat test or flexibility test stuff like that um, but they are all there. I just think it's not very high yield for me to read out because it's literally there. And it's something you won't really touch till unit four anyway. So there are quite a few slides which I'm just going to gloss through here. Um, definitely go back and read them. If you have any like burning questions about these things right now, maybe send a message in the chat. But you won't be touching this for quite a while, typically. Most schools don't. And it's a lot of them are quite straightforward. It's just a lot to rem memorize. So I'd recommend um, flashcarding. Okay, moving on to training methods and principles. Um, the main thing to take away here is that when you are monitoring training, you want to use either training diaries or digital diaries or digital trackers. So things like a Fitbit or a Garmin, um, whereas training diaries are literally like a book or a notebook or a log. Try and compare pros and cons of each. So for instance, with a training diary, people often put down like social aspects. Like, like if I use my Fitbit, and it only records that I ran twice this week as opposed to five times like I wanted to, you might think, oh, was I injured? What, what went wrong here? But if you read a training diary, people often write down, oh, it was pouring rain and flooding, so I didn't want to go running. So stuff like that can provide context to why someone didn't exercise as much as they should have or wanted to or something like that. Whereas digital activity trackers provide information like heart rate or blood pressure or stuff that you won't generally get from a training diary. Okay, so try and think of pros and cons for each. 
And um, we've got three stages of a training session, warm up, conditioning and cool down. And what prepares the body tries to increase the body temperature and also get your mind kind of ready for it. Conditioning is the actual stage of training, like playing a half court game of basketball. And the cool down is like stretching, moving waste from the body, attempting to reduce delayed onset muscle soreness and just trying to use static stretching to decrease muscle stiffness. Uh, we've also got a few training methods and principles. Once again, I've put this, like I've stuffed this entire slide deck very full because it will be quite useful to you later on. Um, <clears throat> there'll probably be another one of these lectures later on in the year, but just in case, like we've got all this info here now. Um, so if you want to use it, you can use it later. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so we typically memorize an acronym such as spit off, which is like a bunch of different phrases like specificity, um, progressive overload, intensity, duration, etc. And it's like, if I decide right now I want to improve my anaerobic capacity um, and be really good at like the 400 meter sprint, I guess, in athletics, how can I train that? Okay, let me do some training sessions which are specific to the anaerobic capacity. Let me make sure I'm progressively overloading each week at a sufficient amount that will allow me to improve. Let me ensure that my intensity is in the right zone for the anaerobic system. Am I working at, you know, 85 to 95% of my max heart rate? Um, is the duration of my training session long enough? It's really about, like, if you want to be a personal trainer sort of for yourself and create a training plan, what you need to do in order to ensure that you're hit, like, hitting all the goals or checkpoints you need in order to improve that particular um, goal of yours. Um, so once again, I'm just, I've put these into the slides here. You're not going to touch them for quite a long time, probably. It's typically a unit four thing. But it's just there for you guys if you want to have a look at it, have a read through, or just save it for when you do get to that area of study. So there's quite a lot of info. Um, and then we've got chronic adaptations, which I'm also just going to gloss through. I probably won't discuss psychological and nutritional things, but I might discuss how to study the subjects for a bit as well. I think that would be the easiest way to do how to study. Um, <clears throat> cool. So I, I have got lots of info here. Tips. I might just give a bit of a brief discussion as to what chronic adaptations are. So I described um, acute responses before, which is like the short-term changes to your body. Chronic adaptations are like the long-term changes to your body. So I used to do quite a lot of like half marathons and run a lot. And I remember thinking my lungs feel amazing. Like, you can often feel these changes. Or if you do exercise quite a bit, you might see changes in your physical body, like the appearance of your body. Um, so these are like the long-term changes that happen to your body as a result of consistent training. Um, most of these ones, which are aerobic, they actually allow for more oxygen to be delivered to your working muscles, which means that we can produce more ATP aerobically. Um, this is kind of getting really quite a bit into unit 4 stuff, which we won't touch for quite a while. But it is there if you guys have a read of if you're interested or if you just want to have this for when we get there. As you can see, I actually don't have a lot of information about these because it is quite a later in the year subject or area of study I guess um, but they are there if you want to have a look at them or if you're considering you know training for a half marathon or 10k or 5k or something like that these are all aerobic changes that happen to your body so you might actually have an increase in the ventricle size I noticed my heart rate definitely decreased at rest um, yeah often your heart gets quite a bit bigger you have an increase in stroke volume your body just works more efficiently really at extracting oxygen um, yeah, so there's quite a bit. Once again, increase in ventricle time. But we probably won't touch on this for quite a while. I hope that's okay, you guys. Um, <clears throat> if you are looking to, like, hear more about this, I think you can actually search old lectures and try and find them there, or old slides and stuff. So, have a read of those if you want to. But I wouldn't really spend a lot of time trying to figure out all of this stuff at the start of the year. Like, you have so much time. And I think the best thing to do is really just try and like stay up to date with your classwork and keep revising old stuff, as opposed to trying to get ahead. So, tips. Psychological and nutritional strategies, just knowing that sleep, confidence, motivation, and then appropriate food and drink are really important. Okay, so we have got 10 minutes left. And I think you guys have this information here, which you can read. I don't want to reread off the slides. Um, but I will go over exam tips and things and what helped me. I don't think I wrote any of it down. Okay, so I might just spend 10 minutes 
If you've got any questions about any area of study that we've covered or we're just kind of skimming through at the end, put them into the chat and I'll try my best to answer them. But I think the best thing which I can do right now is just give you advice as to what helped me or what worked for me throughout high school and even undergrad and even in medicine. So um, <clears throat> I often use the example of when I studied for biology in high school. I would do really well on my stacks, but I would just memorize stuff in the short term and really understand it. Uh, like I remember just memorizing definitions for like distribution and stuff and not really understanding what it meant. So something I would really recommend doing is taking the time to understand all of your content, okay? Don't memorize stuff for the short term. Just actually try and learn everything properly. And the best way to do this, I found, is like, at the end of the year, I actually went to one of these Ethernet lectures. It was a different biology lecturer, um, but I attended her lecture, and I remember feeling like I didn't remember any of the stuff from the year at all. And just going, wow, I, I know nothing about bio. I'm going to get like really great stat grades, but I'm not going to get a good exam grade because I don't understand or know any of this stuff. So it kind of like instigated my like, like hard studying tactic, um, I guess. So what I did was I printed out the study design, as I mentioned before, and I like laminated it, and I got like a whiteboard marker, and I'd go through every area of study and try and learn everything about it. Like I'd go back and read the textbook. I would like get slides. My teacher would make slides, and I would like teach them to my dog or my cat, and I would just like sit them down and be like, okay, today I'm going to teach you about photosynthesis or, I don't know, metabolism or diffusion or whatever. And I would just like sit them down and just try and explain it to them. Because I find if I don't know what I'm talking about when I'm like explaining it out loud, it helps me identify where my flaws in learning are. And it kind of helps me to go back and reevaluate what I do know and what I don't understand. Because ultimately you can't bring anything into the exam or your SAT even. So you really do have to understand everything like pretty full on that you can like explain it to someone. Because ultimately you are trying to explain stuff to the examiner, right? You're trying to prove to them that you know you're learning. So being able to explain it and teach to them is like a good way of doing that. And so what I would do is I would go through each dot point. I would you know, use a slide deck or use my textbook, try and learn all of that. So I'd read it. I'd try and speak it out loud, teach it to my dog or my siblings or my cat or whatever. And try and like make sure that I knew what I was talking about. And then I'd take it off and move on to the next dot point. So I would keep doing this. Um, I also found summary books quite useful, so um, I used a few of them in high school, um, especially for bio, and I found instead of like handwriting all my notes, if I just annotate someone else's notes, which are really well done, then I was actually getting more from that than spending hours handwriting notes. Um, that's personally what worked for me. I know a lot of people say handwriting your notes is better because you learn from it, but I often find if I'm just handwriting stuff and copying from my textbook, I just kind of zone out. So instead, if I get someone else's notes and annotate them and try and teach that back to someone else, I take more from that. Um, what I also did is I made an Ata Notes account. As I mentioned before, it's like a completely anonymous type thing. Um, and I just, yeah, I made an Ata Notes account. I, I would go into the forums, like the subject specific forums, and every time I get a question wrong, like a tax exam, I would just put it on the forum. And at first I was like really nervous because I was like, wow, these people are judging me so hard. But they don't even know who I am. Okay, so yeah, if you've got a question and you're stuck, you can either save it all to ask your teacher or you can pop it in the forums and hopefully someone gets back to you very quickly. And I remember getting questions answered within like 30 seconds, especially during like exam time. Because people just, they enjoy helping out other people, which is really great. So the forums are totally free. Um, some of them are super active. Like the bio one was really active. I think some of the math ones are quite active too. Um, and I think hopefully PA is a bit more since the like the relaunch of the site, I guess. Um, but yeah, anytime I had a question, I'd pop it on there, and I would like I would do practice exams. Like I found doing practice exams the highest yield type thing I could do for my studying. So I would do practice exams every time I got a question wrong or any time I was a bit unsure about an answer, even if I did get it correct. I would put it on the forums and get a big definition about it. I'd write that definition down in my book. I would go back and like search the textbook for more about it. And I would write that down and teach it to my pets or myself or the wall or whatever. That kind of helped me to recognize which areas of study I was getting a bit stuck on. And what I would do is I'd go back and read this list of errors like every day um, and try and figure out what they meant or if I fully understood it. And I just keep doing practice questions, practice exams, and just keep trying to like assess um, <clears throat> what I was doing wrong or what I need to work on and just keep reviewing that consistently. And so I kind of found that over time, I actually started to make less mistakes. Like, I started off getting, like, 40% of my practice exams, and then getting, like, 60, 70, 80, 90, even close to 100 at a time, um, just because I was doing that, like, reviewing the areas of study that I was 
wrong, your errors and things. Um, yeah, so really making an errors book, making an A to notes account and spamming those forums and teaching what I learned to someone else was really, really useful to me and helped me to fully understand what I was talking about and what I was learning. Um, those, so yeah, those are my three main things. Teach it to someone else. I know people say this a lot, um, teach it to someone else, but it is it like a, an actual like verified technique just for learning and studying. I forget the name of it, but I was like reading this like how to study type, I don't know, site or dwellers and they talked about this technique and I was like, wait, I've been doing this for years and it's literally teach someone else. And yeah, so it sounds like such a, oh, it's so easy to do, but it's very, very useful. Um, people often use spaced repetition as well, so an active recall. So what this means is you might like study a particular area of study, go back and revise it tomorrow, and then revise it again in three days time, and then revise it in a week's time, and then in two weeks time or a month. And like doing that over time actually helps to keep it kind of fresh in your mind. Also trying to like recall it from your brain. So this is why doing flashcards is quite useful because it's like you have maybe a definition on one side and the phrase on the other side. And if you just see the phrase, Try and recall what the definition is and flip it over and then see if you got it right. And then do that again the next day and then three days time and five days time, seven days, etc. So you are like spreading that study over time and it is helping you to kind of keep it fresh in your mind, which is really useful and it actually does help consolidate learning in the long term, which is what you need for the exam. So for example, like you guys will get this PDF or this slide deck if you just like copy and paste all of those definitions like um, blocks or random practice or distributed or massed and just make flashcards out of them and print them out and just kind of practice those over time like I would do my flashcards in the car or in the bus or something like that that really helped me um, so stuff like that is really useful so we have got a few minutes left you guys so if you do have any more questions please pop them into the chat and I will try and answer them um, I think the chat will close very shortly but yeah um, Trying to think of other advice. If you have any questions about like biomedicine or medicine even, let me know as well and I'll do my best to answer those too. But yeah, hopefully this was a useful lecture for you guys. Thank you for coming along on your holidays. I know it's, or I don't know if you guys are still on holidays this time, but it's such a like a nice time at the moment with Kosani and stuff and it's nice that you guys are like sitting here and watching this. So hopefully you enjoyed it. Hopefully you do take some stuff away. Um, as I mentioned before, I didn't go through a lot of the stuff, especially the stuff towards the end, because it don't come up for a long time, and it's not as high yield as some of the stuff earlier on, which might be relevant for your sex at the moment. So definitely go back to the biomechanics stuff, um, and the, mostly biomechanics, and some of the energy system stuff, but yeah, it was mostly biomechanics at the moment, as well as some of the skills and coaching. I do find that B kind of like eases you into the year as well, so... It's nice to start off with something like skills and coaching and then move into the heavier stuff. Um, but yeah, hopefully that really helps you out, you guys. Uh, thank you for coming. Good luck for the year. Hopefully if I end this, you can guys keep putting questions in the chat. Um, but yeah. Send me any more questions you have. Shoot me an email if you want to. And yeah, thank you guys for coming. And good luck for the rest of the year.